Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Heart Health Lecture Series from the Prevention Center uh, at NYU Langone uh, and the Grossman School of Medicine. My name is Dr. Dennis Goodman. I'm a clinical professor of medicine in the Department of Medicine and Cardiology, and I'm Director of Integrative Medicine as well. I welcome you to our evening this evening. We have a fabulous speaker who's well known to you. I just want to go through a few little logistics. Uh, how do I ask a question? If you have a question that, you've, that you'd like to ask, you go to the Q&A box at the bottom. I think you're familiar with this now. I'll be looking at the questions and I'll ask our speaker at the end and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Next slide. I want to remind you about our upcoming lectures that are coming up. I know you, you know that uh, we're very proud of this lecture series. Um, the upcoming lectures are on Tuesday, December 13th. Yoga, mindfulness, and meditation. Good for your heart. That's for sure. And you're going to hear all about it. And then on Thursday, January 12th, anti-aging strategies and treatments. What's the hype? That's something that everybody's interested in. Um, just to note, please take note that the time is going to be from 12 at noon, 12 to 1 p.m. that day. To register, you can see the address down at the bottom. I'll go through that in again for you in a minute on another slide. Next slide. So we've had over 50 lectures since we started the series in 2015. I'm so grateful to Anya uh, and to Julia who've helped me with this series. And we're very proud because... We've done so many lectures where there's a huge amount of interest. Uh, please tell your friends about this. As you can see right now, you can see many of the topics that we've covered. You can read them and we land up coming back to some of the topics so that we can update you. Some of the very popular ones have been sleep. Should I take an aspirin? Uh, of course, how do you treat cholesterol, diabetes, prevention of stroke? We're all about prevention and being healthy. And we know that one of the most important things to realize is that 80% of heart attacks and strokes are preventable with healthy lifestyle. And that's what we keep reinforcing. And tonight we're going to be doing something in that vein uh, related to nutrition. Next slide. So we have a YouTube library night now where we've got 28 videos. We've had over 80,000 views. And if you get onto our website, you can get directly to the YouTube link and you can watch many of the lectures that have been recorded. Tonight's lecture will also be recorded. Next slide. So how, this is how you keep in touch with us. You can see there's different ways, the website, email, and Twitter. Next slide, Anya. So this is a website that's very easy uh, for you to access, nyulangone.org heart health lecture series for those of you at home uh, if you've got your phone uh, just take a picture of this otherwise it's very easy to remember you can get into all our videos you can sign up for future future lectures and you can find out all about us at that website next slide so tonight it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce you to our guest speaker she's an absolute rock star i've told her this before uh, Melissa Azraki, um, somebody that I've had on several times. She's a favorite of, she's a favorite uh, of ours. She always does a fabulous job, and she is a nutritionist and an RDN. She is a registered dietitian and certified in and certified in diabetes care and education specialist. She received her Master of Science in Clinical Nutrition and completed her diabetic internship at New York University. She's currently a clinical care manager at Kalina Health. It's a group practice committed to providing affordable nutrition counseling across the country. Prior to this, Melissa worked as a clinical dietitian in New York City hospitals like NYU Langone Health and New York Methodist Hospital for more than eight years. Melissa is passionate about achieving good health with good food. Next slide. And her topic tonight is grocery shopping for heart health. Uh, we chose this because there's so many people who come and tell us that it's so hard to be shopping for the correct food. How do you know what you're supposed to be eating? There's all these choices, literally hundreds of choices. Every time you walk into a grocery store, I could think of no one better than Melissa to 
give this lecture for us. She's spoken for me and at my major conferences many times. She's always a crowd favorite. And we are so grateful and privileged, Melissa, to have you back. So I'll hand it over to you and we'll reconvene at the end of your talk for Q&A. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Dr. Goodman, and for having me. I'm excited to talk to you all about what is genuinely one of my favorite places. I love the grocery store, uh, but I understand that there can be a lot of decision making that has to happen. Next slide. So I thought we'd start by talking a little bit about what does heart healthy eating look like so we know what we're looking for at the store. And we'll talk about some strategies to optimize your grocery shopping, including how to use labels and nutrition facts and how to keep it heart healthy on a budget. Next slide. So in order to be talking about heart healthy eating, next slide, we really need to be talking about dietary patterns. A dietary pattern is really just everything you eat and drink in a day, accounting for the relative frequency with which you choose different foods and beverages. Next slide. And lately, literature is showing us there is a stronger association between your overall dietary pattern and health outcomes, such as cardiovascular disease, than there is between individual foods and nutrients and health outcomes. And that is probably because you and I and the guy next door have never once gone to the grocery store to purchase monounsaturated fats or magnesium. We buy foods with multiple nutrients in various combinations. So these patterns better represent the way we actually eat. And it also accounts for the way that the nutrients within a food or the nutrients in different foods can be interacting with each other. So for example, fish is good for us, but having a piece of fish with a side of broccoli and some lentils may be even better because of the different matrices of nutrients. Next slide. There are a few heart healthy eating patterns that have been coming up a lot in the literature. I wanted to highlight three that have really stayed at the top of the pile for the last few years. Uh, and if you were with us last year, some of the, when I gave a talk about seasonal eating, some of this might look familiar. Um, not much has changed. We're still talking a lot about the Mediterranean style eating pattern, about a DASH eating plan, uh, and about various plant-based diets, whether it be a strict vegan diet or something more like a semi-vegetarian or flexitarian diet, which would be intentionally including a larger volume of plant-based meals, but you're not religious about it. Sometimes you eat a piece of fish. You might even have a burger here and there. It's just changing the foundation of what you're eating. And I think that this image of a Mediterranean diet pyramid kind of does a good job of giving a visual on that. When we get into the nitty gritty of all of these different eating patterns, there are a few common themes that come up over and over again. So I wanted to just boil it down into those that you can take away as sort of your heart healthy eating headlines. Next slide. First headline, eat mostly whole or minimally processed food. Very few foods are not processed at all, right? If we kind of dry the quinoa to put it in a bag, right? It got, it got lightly processed. But the key is that the closer something looks to the way it grew from the ground or swam the seas or walked the earth, typically the better it's going to be as part of our overall eating pattern. Next. Eat more plants. Certainly this is non-starchy vegetables. Uh, I rarely get resistance on that from people, but I like to point out that this includes vegetables that are rich in carbohydrate. Carbohydrates have gotten a bad rap, but heart healthy eating and eating patterns do include fruits, starchy vegetables, whole grains, legumes. All of these foods are part of the plan. Next slide. Get most of your fat from plants meaning vegetable oils such as olive oil, uh, nuts and seeds, avocado. This is a shift in thinking, right? From many of us who made it through the low fat 90s where all fat was bad. Now we know that it depends where our fat is coming from. And these foods usually factor pretty heavily into a heart healthy diet. Next slide. There's also the idea of getting at least some of our protein from plants. 
So when we look at a lot of those eating patterns, even if we're not going vegan or lacto-ovo vegetarian, what we see is that compared to the standard American diet, where a lot of our protein tends to come from meat and poultry and dairy and eggs, there's a benefit to just kind of giving it a shift so that a larger percentage of the protein is coming from some seafood, but also some plants. And ideally, if we're talking about doing it for heart health, this protein can be coming from the nuts and seeds we just talked about, but it could also be coming from legumes, beans, lentils, and chickpeas. It could also be coming from soy products. So that could be the edamame, which you see on the screen is how the edamame grows, that's the soybean itself, or something like tofu or tempeh, kind of like a minimally processed uh, soy protein. Next. Low-fat dairy, fish, eggs, lean poultry, these things can still be used. Depending on your medical history and your goals, it might be best to do some of this in moderation. Uh, fatty and red meats, animal fats, solid fats, added sugar, packaged snacks, refined carbohydrates should typically be used more sparingly. And again, if you've seen me talk before, you've seen these little piggies before, they're always with me and they always agree that red, less red meat is a good idea. Next slide. Okay, so now we know what types of foods we're looking for. Let's go shopping. And what's the first step before we go shopping? Next slide. This might seem really simplistic, but I can't tell you how many times I end up talking about this in sessions with patients or setting individual very detailed goals around this. The key to a successful shop is starting with a list and sometimes just setting aside the time it takes to think about it can feel onerous if you are a really busy person. So start with a list for success. And I've put on the left some basic categories that you're probably gonna wanna make sure are covered on your list. We're gonna go through all of those in a little bit more detail shortly. I also wanted to talk about different approaches to making your list. Some people like to meal plan for a whole week in advance. They know what dishes they're going to make on what day, and so they're going to put the ingredients for those dishes on their list. That's fine if that works for you, but if that doesn't work for you, that's also okay. You can keep it a little bit more flexible. Just think about the number of meals you know you're going to have to cook next week, and think about the fact that a balanced meal ideally contains a source of protein, some non-starchy vegetables, and some sort of high-fiber carbohydrate. Okay? Then you're going to do a little inventory. You're gonna check your pantry, check your freezer, see what you've already got on hand. Think about what do you need to plug in to be able to make those balanced meals for your next week. And so maybe you just have on your list, like, all right, I need three proteins and three vegetables. And then you go to the store and you see what's on sale or you see what looks good. That's totally fine too. You don't have to have it all ironed out before you go. Next slide. As always, there's an app for that, right? If you are someone who wants to utilize smartphone apps to help organize you around shopping. There are some options out there. Cozy is the app that my family actually uses. We like that there's a shared list. My husband and I can both throw things on. If we get something, we check it off so we can see it's been handled. Uh, it also has a feature where you can search recipes and then have the app kind of populate ingredients into your list from the recipe. Uh, there is another option called Flip. It has those shared lists, but also incorporates some coupons and circulars. Uh, Next, but also uh, it is totally okay to keep it simple. If you are not into apps and smartphones, pen and paper works great. Uh, I also recently learned from our lovely coordinator, Anya, that you can actually share a note on your iPhone and have multiple family members adding to it. And so you just keep a running note or maybe you keep a running email draft. Like what's the key is just to make sure you've set aside some time in your week to give thought to what types of foods you need to procure when you go grocery shopping. And it probably won't take you more than 10 minutes. Next. All right, we've made our list. We feel good about it. We're going to the store. What's the first advice you typically hear when we're talking about grocery shopping and healthy eating? We always say shop the perimeter. This is probably not the first time most of you have heard it. Uh, it is true. Uh, we still say that because the perimeter is where a lot of those whole minimally processed foods are gonna live. So let's start on the perimeter. Next. We definitely want to spend some time in the produce section. 
As we said, more plants are at the foundation of most of our heart healthy eating patterns. So of course, non-starchy vegetables. This does not have to just be leafy green things. You can also be looking for a little bit more variety, more color. It can be eggplant, cauliflower, peppers, summer squash, radishes, okra, mushrooms. Uh, sometimes if it doesn't look the way our standard Western diet looks, if you grew up eating callaloo, if you grew up eating collards, all that's great. Um, let's talk about starchy vegetables. I think starchy vegetables got a bad rap uh, because we got mad at carbohydrates. But as we have talked about, carbohydrates can be part of a heart healthy eating pattern. We just wanna think about what kind we're choosing. And we might wanna think about the balance of our plate. The starchy vegetables listed here, your potatoes, yams, winter squash, green banana, those are absolutely reasonable sources of high fiber carbohydrate, right? That also contain vitamins and minerals and protective antioxidants. We can incorporate these. We just have to know that although these are vegetables, they act more in our body like pasta or brown rice than they do like broccoli. So when you're planning your plate, right? You may have seen an image like this before. We just wanna know that this little quarter of our plate is either yam or sweet potato or corn or rice. We're gonna put about a fist sized portion and balance it out with our other foods. Fruits, any fruit you wanna eat in my opinion, even if you have diabetes, even if you have pre-diabetes, portion per sitting might matter. If you're unsure about portions, that is a good time to talk to a registered dietitian who can kind of take your needs and medical history into account to give you some guidance. That way you're not unnecessarily restricting foods you love. Uh, in the produce section, don't forget to look for flavoring agents, which are can be really great ways to add flavor without adding extra salt if you're looking to be on a lower sodium plan. Um, and also can be pretty cheap and cheerful. We never leave the grocery store without lemons, limes, garlic, onions, ginger tip. You can freeze it, just like freeze the whole knob. And then every time you need some, you take it out and you just peel off the length you're going to use with a spoon and you can grate it straight from frozen. Uh, next slide. Ah, also, when you're in the produce section, uh, there is some plant-based protein to be had there. Usually that's where you're going to find your tofu and it might be where you find some other lightly processed soy-based proteins if you're looking to bring those in. Next. I'm not going to read off everything on here. Um, there's a lot of content and you will be getting a link to this lecture afterwards. So if you want to go back and pause and scribble some things down, the headline is, as we move around the store and we come to our animal proteins, anything from the seafood section goes. That includes fin fish like your salmon and your cod. Also shellfish. A lot of people ask me about shellfish. They ask me about shrimp in particular. And the problem with shrimp was cholesterol, right? So here we're going to introduce the question of cholesterol because it's going to come up a few times. Um, shrimp are one of the few foods that are pretty high in cholesterol, but kind of low in saturated fat. Most of the time, cholesterol and saturated fat tend to co-occur in foods like your fatty red meats and your butter and your full fat dairy. Um, and what's happened is over time, research has shown us that the cholesterol in food is not having as great an impact on the cholesterol in our blood as other types of fats are. That it's really the saturated fats and the trans fats that are jacking up that LDL cholesterol, that's the bad cholesterol, that are even interfering with the way we lose, use glucose, right? That may be making our blood sugars creep up. Uh, and so based on that research we were seeing about the types of fats and the fact that when we pull back and look at the big picture, and we see that people on a pescatarian type diet who are eating a variety of seafood and including shellfish, do just fine, I feel very comfortable to give shrimp back. So choose anything from the seafood section, choose skinless poultry, uh, including the thighs. Right? I, I think bringing in some dark meat is a-okay, just remove the skin. Um, and I think ground turkey or chicken can also be a nice way to break things up a little bit and bring a new texture for meatballs, for tacos, for maybe like a meat sauce. Meats like pork and beef, it is recommended that they be chosen less often. And if you're gonna do them, do a leaner cut. For example, a pork tenderloin is nice and lean. Next. Finally, as we make our way around the rest of the perimeter, we're gonna come into the dairy section. Low fat, fat-free dairy can absolutely be part of the plan. 
And if you choose to, you can also use some plant-based replacements. <clears throat> Just make sure that you're choosing something unsweetened. Remember with things like a soy milk and an almond milk, plain does not mean unsweetened. It just means not vanilla or chocolate. You want to make sure it says unsweetened on there. Yogurts, absolutely part of the plan. Really nice sources of protein. Uh, you can look for a plain not non-fat or low-fat yogurt. If you prefer a flavored yogurt, just do some comparison shopping. Look for something low in added sugar. We're going to talk more about the labels soon. Uh, some brands I like are Shobani Less Sugar or Siggy's. You can do some cheese, um, really any cheese you like, and just be aware of the frequency with which you choose it, right? That's that overall pattern, like that Mediterranean pyramid. You'll usually find some nice dips around the perimeter, like hummus or baba ganoush. And then finally, eggs, another really controversial one, right? Um, research goes back and forth on this, I'm going to be honest. And again, it's a question of the cholesterol, right? Because eggs are pretty high in cholesterol. They're fairly moderate and saturated fat. They're an affordable and easy to prepare sense of uh, source of protein. And they've got other important nutrients in them like choline. So for me, based on where we stand on the evidence, I say eggs make the cut. You just have to think about your overall dietary pattern. Meaning I'm not gonna tell you to go eat a two or three egg omelet every single day, but you can incorporate it as part of a, a varied plan. Next. All right, we've shopped the perimeter. I'm thirsty from all that shopping. Give me a sec. Now we're gonna journey into the aisles because there are plenty of nutritious, heart healthy things to be found in the aisles of the store as well. We just have to know what we're looking for and we have to be savvy shoppers. Next slide. This is where we have to start talking about packaging, right? Because food companies are smart. They know that a lot of people like you are thinking about how your food choices impact your health. They know that we want to make helpful decisions. Uh, they also still really wanna sell you chips. And so they will design packaging, they will find claims that they can add that will call to us to that sense of wanting to eat for better health. And sometimes it's spot on and sometimes it can lead us astray. And so we end up with what we call the health halo, which is the tendency to overestimate the healthfulness of a food based on its packaging, maybe a single nutrient claim or even corporate reputation. We think they're good guys. They wouldn't do anything to hurt us. This was one of my favorite examples. I don't know if you all remember this, but I remember when Simply Lay's came out um, and it was versions of all of their usual snacks, but all of a sudden the bags were different colors. They weren't even this colorful. They were like brown and green and neutral earth tones and the words say simple and organic. And all of a sudden it feels so much more virtuous. It's still a chip. Just know that it's a chip. You can still have it. We just don't want to be deluded into thinking it's anything else. All right, next slide. This is another one of my favorite examples. When I buy a gummy candy, which I sometimes buy, I eat candy, uh, and there's all these claims on the front, fat-free, low sodium. Well, surely then it must be a great heart healthy choice. Uh, no, it's still candy. And so again, we just wanna make sure we're going in making informed intentional choices. We wanna know how to evaluate the big picture and not just make decisions based on a single front of pack claim, claim or some smart graphic design. Next. So we have to talk about the nutrition facts panel. For you to be a smart shopper, you have to know how to decode what you see here. So I'm gonna start by showing you where on the panel we wanna look, and then I'm gonna break down some of the nutrients a little bit more for you. You're always gonna start with the serving size. Now this may or may not be how much of the food you choose to eat. This food company doesn't know you. They don't know your goals. They don't know your needs, but it is gonna tell you how much of this particular food the information on the panel pertains to. The next thing you're going to look at is the saturated fat and trans fat. We want foods that are lower in saturated fat and trans fat for a heart healthy plan. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. I know there's questions. The next thing you're going to look at is the sodium. When we're talking about a heart healthy eating pattern, typically we recommend no more than 2300 milligrams of sodium. If you're someone with hypertension, you might be choosing to pull back to 1500 if you're trying to optimize your blood pressure. If you're someone with heart failure, you may have been given a recommendation of 2,000 milligrams. So you're going to check the sodium content, remembering that it doesn't have to be zero. 
You just want to compare the content to your daily sodium budget to see how it stacks up. Next slide. The next things that I would look at are fiber and added sugar. A few years ago, uh, the government updated the regulations for nutrition facts, and now the food companies do have to separate out total sugars and added sugars. And when it comes to cardiometabolic health, it's the added sugars that I'm most concerned about. Next slide. Okay, so let's take a little, slightly closer look at what's going on with the fat section and then what's going on with the carbohydrate section. As we've touched on before, looking at the saturated fat and the trans fat is way more important, in my opinion, than looking at the total fat or the cholesterol in most cases, in most cases, um, because evidence is showing us that it's really the saturated fat and the trans fat that's jacking up our bad cholesterol, not great for our liver health, not great for our blood sugar balance, among many things. And so you're looking at this information, you gotta have a standard by which to judge what you're seeing. If we wanted to go by the guidelines from the American Heart Association and the National Lipid Association, which are the most stringent guidelines on saturated fat you're gonna find out there, most of us would end up needing somewhere between 10 and 15 grams of saturated fat per day, right? It's not zero. Now, if you start looking at all of your labels, you are gonna turn around your bottle of olive oil and you're gonna see it's got three grams of saturated fat in a tablespoon. You're gonna see that there's saturated fat in your peanut butter, right? Don't panic. Pretty much what it stacks up to be is the allotment we have based on these guidelines accounts for there being a few grams of saturated fat scattered throughout a variety of the heart healthy foods we recommend because all foods are actually made of a, a variety of fats. No food has only one type. If you compare that to the foods that are limited in heart healthy eating patterns and look at their saturated fat content, you are much more likely to easily exceed those limits when you're eating those foods frequently or in larger portions. For example, six grams of saturated fat and three ounces of ground beef. Well, three ounces is like my little palm. So unless your hamburger looks like this, right? You might've had your whole fill of saturated fat for the day just from that burger patty. You haven't even eaten anyone else, anything else, let alone put cheese on your burger. Trans fat is one nutrient that we do say avoid as much as possible. And it really has been mostly shunned from the food supply. And then again, cholesterol is controversial. Uh, some organizations still have it in their guidelines to aim for something like two to 300 milligrams of cholesterol. Some organizations have taken it out of the guidelines entirely. In my opinion, if we are thinking about the big picture, if we're aiming for a heart healthy eating pattern, it kind of takes care of cholesterol for us because that cholesterol tends to co-occur with the saturated fat in those foods that we eat more sparingly. And so we don't really have to spend a lot of time and energy micromanaging our cholesterol intake. We can use our energy someplace else. Next. Now let's take a peek at the carbohydrates. I think the most important part of the carbohydrate section for your heart health is the fiber and the added sugar. Especially if you're gonna comparison shop between two like items, for example, a cereal. We want things that are higher in fiber, lower in added sugar. So take, for example, the two labels here. These are two cereals side by side. First, I'm gonna look at the serving size. I wanna make sure I'm comparing like to like, not a cup and a half serving to three quarter cup serving. So a cup and a half of cereal on the left is giving me four grams of dietary fiber, nice, and only one gram of added sugar. I like that. Uh, whereas the cereal on the left, a cup, not too far off in serving size, giving me three grams of dietary fiber, fine, that's pretty comparable, giving me 11 grams of added sugar. That's a pretty significant difference. I'm gonna choose the cereal on the left. Uh, and if you're curious, the cereal on the left is a plain yellow box Cheerio. And the cereal on the right is one of those flavored Kashi's like a vanilla almond or something. An example of another brand that did a really good job giving themselves a health halo. This cereal has 11 grams of added sugar. Next slide. Next, let's talk about how we evaluate the ingredients. When you look at the ingredients on a food, we want to know that it's listed in order of what there is most of in the food, all the way down to what there is least of in the food. And this can be a really helpful tool for you as well. Uh, here we're going to come into a section of the presentation where I took a bunch of pictures of food from my own pantry and refrigerator in my own kitchen 
they are not Instagram worthy. I'm sorry, but I think they get the point across. Um, and I very purposely chose two bread products because this comes up a lot. So if you look on the left, we have a loaf of whole wheat bread. And that font is tiny, but if you squint, you can see that the first ingredient is whole wheat flour. That's what I wanna see when I'm looking at breads, tortillas, or crackers. That means the majority of it is made from a whole, whole grain flour. If you squint at the second product, which is an English muffin and it's that Dave's Killer Bread brand that tends to be higher in fiber, um, the first ingredient is a mix of organic flours and the first flour just says organic wheat flour. Then after that, it starts to list a string of whole wheat flour, barley flour, rye, spelt, quinoa, etc. That means that's what multigrain is, right? When you're looking at two things of bread and one says multigrain and one says whole grain, you're always going to flip to look at the ingredients. Typically, the one where the whole grain flours are listed higher up in the ingredients are the ones you want to choose. Otherwise, multigrain just means more than one type of grain and it could still be predominantly refined white flour. Next. And now I thought it might be fun to do a little exercise together with what we've already learned. Uh, this is a real life example because uh, my husband and my seven-year-old daughter recently went on a little jaunt to Wegmans without me and they came back with all sorts of stuff, including these two boxes as school snacks. Uh, so on the left, we have a fruit and grain bar. And on the right, we have a chewy chocolate chunk granola bar. So if we're looking at the front of the pack only, think about which one would you choose? What would you have as a snack? What would you put in your kid's lunchbox, right? Well, I'm looking at this Wegmans one. Mm, fruit and grain sounds promising. Those are things in a heart healthy diet. Uh, there's big glossy pictures of strawberries, right? They look healthy. Uh, it's organic grains. I'm getting a lot of health halo. Uh, the Quaker one does talk about having whole grains. We like that. And then it's got like big mountainous crags of chocolate. Maybe feels less healthy than the strawberry. Next. All right, let's look at the ingredients. Let's see what we think about the ingredients. Again, if you squint. Uh, on the left is the strawberry bar. The first ingredient is strawberry filling. The first ingredient of which is organic cane syrup. That's code for sugar. Uh, then you have your strawberries, fine. Apple powder, okay. And then after that, a bunch of fruit juice, juice concentrates, which again, although derived from fruit, are pretty much code for added sweetener. And after that, tapioca starch. So when we think about the first ingredients, the stuff that there is most of in this bar, a lot of it is added sugar and processed starch. Okay, noted. Now I'm going to look at the granola bar, where the first ingredient is granola, the first ingredient of which is whole grain oats. Okay, I like that a little bit better than the first ingredient being sugar. Then there is some brown sugar, fine, but then it goes back to some whole grains. So based on the, new, the ingredients, I'm actually starting to favor the granola bar a little bit. Next slide. Let's see how it bears out in the nutrition facts. So for one bar, again on the left, the strawberry bar, I am looking at the saturated fat, zero grams, great. Uh, on the right, the granola bar, 0.5 grams, I don't feel super fussed about that when we think about the grand scheme, unless I was gonna eat 10 of the granola bars, that's not gonna make a big dent. So let's look at the fiber. Less than one gram of fiber in the strawberry bar and one gram in the granola bar. Not very impressive either way. Now let's look at the added sugar. That strawberry bar has 14 grams of added sugar, I think, it's even too small for me to read, uh, whereas the granola bar has only seven. So you've got double the added sugar in the bar where based on the front of pack, it looks so much more virtuous. So I think this is a really good example of what happens when we go a little bit further, when we're smart shoppers, when we know how to use our nutrition facts panel and our ingredients to make decisions. Next slide. Okay, now that we know how to evaluate packages, let's talk about what we're looking for in the aisles. You definitely want to hit the aisle with all of the whole grains and the legumes. Um, in the city, usually that's where we have all our Goya products. That's how I think of it. Um, and you could be buying the dried grains and the dried beans, lentils and chickpeas. Lentils do cook pretty quickly without soaking. Beans and chickpeas do need soaking the night before if you're gonna cook them from scratch. You can also use some convenience items from this aisle. There are some good time savers here. Canned beans or chickpeas are fine. 
You can look for low sodium options. You can give them a little rinse. You can also usually find some minute cups of whole grains that microwave up fast. Also usually in this aisle is the couscous for some reason. Now couscous is actually tiny pasta, but you can sometimes find a whole wheat couscous and that cooks in about five minutes, a really great quick dinner option. Next. You can be purchasing bread, cereals, or pastas and still be following a heart healthy plan. Again, you're gonna use that label reading, right? So you're gonna look for the first ingredient to be whole wheat or whole grain. If you're looking for crackers and breads and cereals, you can comparison shop. So when you're looking at the breads, you want higher fiber, maybe higher protein content per serving. When you're looking at your cereals, you want higher fiber and protein, lower added sugar. And there's some ideas there of brands you can look for. Same for pastas. You could absolutely do a whole wheat pasta, that's fine. You could also experiment with some of the legume-based pastas that have been coming out from lentils or chickpeas, et cetera. Next slide. We gotta buy some snacks. It's okay to snack, right? Let's snack intentionally. Let's incorporate some of these nutrient-dense foods into a balanced snack. Whole grain crackers work really well. I like Triscuits and Wasa crackers for this. They're fairly low in sodium pretty high in fiber. Popcorn is a whole grain. That's a great one. Um, and you want to look for a brand that's relatively low in sodium, relatively low in added fat, like your Skinny Pop or your Boom Chicka Pop. Seaweed snacks can be a good option if you're into that. There's also a lot of great legume-based snacks that have been coming out lately. Um, and I listed some specific brands here. You just do want to be aware of the sodium content if you're someone who's following a limited sodium diet. Again, just make sure to fit it into your budget for the day. Next slide. These I've called multitaskers because I think they can really live in so many different places throughout the day. They're so versatile and I think it is key to have them around as long as you are not allergic. Nuts and seeds, any nut or seed. Often people ask me which one is the best. Variety is good nutrition because each nut and seed is gonna give you a slightly different profile of vitamins, minerals, protective antioxidants, fatty acids, and it helps keep it a little fresh for you if you can alternate. Uh, any nut or seed butters, including peanut butter, all oh, that's fine. Just stick it in the fridge and it'll last a little longer. Also olives. These can be part of balanced meals as some plant-based protein or healthy fat. These can be added to snacks to make a balanced snack. For example, a piece of fruit and a palm full of nuts. Um, so I think these are great to have around. Next slide. Now let's talk about going into the freezer aisle or even dabbling in some canned goods. Uh, I think many of us have this image of what heart healthy eating looks like. And we think that we have to trek to Whole Foods and only buy what is fresh and organic and in season and all that's great, but it doesn't have to be only that. Frozen veggies are actually totally fine. They're not nutritionally inferior to fresh vegetables. Um, as long as you're not buying something that's already sauced or flavored, you're good to go. You can also usually find some nice starchy vegetable options in the freezer aisle, something like green peas or corn. Also frozen fruit can be nice. Um, and these are really helpful as well for quick meal prep because they're already all broken down for you. They're ready to go. Uh, if you are following a low sodium plan, you've probably been told to avoid or limit canned foods. And if we have a choice, I agree, all right? So let's say I'm looking for some green beans and I don't wanna buy from fresh or I can't. If I have the choice between frozen and canned, I'm going to choose frozen because the can does have added sodium. But there are some foods that we really can't get in any other convenient shelf stable way. And their nutritional benefits to me outweigh the moderate amount of sodium that they're gonna add, and you just have to fit it into your budget. So any canned fish, uh, any canned beans, as we said, low sodium broths for flavor or food prep, it can be nice to saute in a little broth, uh, or something like a low sodium uh, diced tomato for making sauces or tacos, all of that's fine. You can also find some nice convenience items for nights that you just can't cook. Uh, there are low sodium soups available, 
that have a lot of heart healthy ingredients. Look for vegetables and whole grains and legumes. Uh, Amy's Organic is a brand that makes a lot of nice low sodium options. There are also some frozen meals that fit the bill. Again, Amy's Organic makes some. There's another brand called Evol. Some of the lean cuisines are not bad. Uh, you're just gonna use your label reading skills, right? Use your ingredient skills. Look for stuff that's got vegetables and whole grains and heart healthy proteins rather than, you know, even if it's a lean cuisine, the meal that say is mac and cheese and it's just a smaller portion of mac and cheese, right? Let's be real about what they do there. You can also find some dessert options that are nice compromises, uh, like the Yasso bars are a nice uh, frozen yogurt, lower sugar option. Next slide. Finally, we wanna make sure that we can give our food flavor. So you can shop the aisles for various condiments. You can get your heart healthy cooking oils, Vinegars are a really good way to pep up flavor without adding more salt. And then finally, your spices and dried herbs, these are key. If you can stock a nice spice wrap, you can take the basic building blocks of the heart healthy plate, right? You can take this, which let's be honest, there's only so many options, and you can give it so many different flavor profiles. And it can be really helpful. Next slide. All that said, I know I'm now showing you a picture. <laughs> of all of these foods that you did not expect to see. I usually encourage patients to think about the 80-20 rule. We just talked about all of these beautiful nutrient-dense foods that we wanna eat most of the time in order to prevent cardiovascular disease, prevent diabetes, you know, pursue good health. And if we can eat that way 80 to 90% of the time, that means that 10 to 20% of the time we can be eating ice cream, chips, I've been craving a, craving a croissant ever since I made this slide. I'll probably have to get one soon. There is room. You just wanna think about the overall balance of your day, the balance of your week. And if you find that your 10 to 20% foods are starting to creep up to more like 40, 50 or 60%, then it's time to have a conversation with yourself about how you can shift the balance again. Next slide. Finally, I did wanna to quickly touch on how we can keep it heart healthy on a budget. Prices have gotten crazy lately. Um, we can still keep it heart healthy. It helps if you buy produce in season, if you're buying fresh produce. You don't have to go to the farmer's market, although that's great. Uh, I find that even when I go to just my local store, if I go to a stop and shop or a key food, usually the produce that's in season is out in front and it's on sale. So if I tried to buy some asparagus or some blueberries right now, I would pay a pretty penny. But if I wait until the spring, the asparagus will go on sale. And if I wait until the summer, the blueberries will go on sale. Uh, of course, checking the circulars. I still like the paper circular. I, I think that's great, but there are apps that can help too. And if you can stock up on sale items, if you have the budget to put out a little more money up front, you buy more of it when it's on sale. So like an extra pound of fish, and then you portion it out and throw it in your freezer for later or a few extra yogurts if the best buy date is two weeks out. Um, also, like we were saying, don't be afraid of shelf stable and frozen options uh, if you're concerned that things are gonna go bad before you get to them, right? You know how to read labels now, you know what to choose. Frozen fruits and veggies are fine, right? Canned beans are fine. These are things that are often more cost-effective and they'll hang around and wait for you if you didn't get to it this week. I also think it's really helpful if we're conscious of repurposing or freezing our leftovers so that we minimize food waste that way too. So for example, if you sauteed a whole bunch of greens and you didn't get to them all and you're not a big fan of eating leftover meals the next day, you can throw those into some scrambled eggs and make yourself a nice breakfast. Uh, if you just can't bring yourself to eat one more bowl of that giant pot of stew you made, just throw a quart right in the freezer and you'll have it another time. Uh, there are certain heart healthy foods that I find to typically be pretty budget friendly. Uh, things like cabbage, a head of cabbage will take you a long way. Oats, peanut butter, canned beans, brown rice. Usually you can get a pretty good price on these and they're perfectly heart healthy. Next slide. Finally, if you do want to use an app instead of just coupon cutting and going through the circular, uh, there are some app recommendations here for those as well. Next slide. Thank you so much, everyone, for your attention and for joining tonight. My contact information is here. 
uh, please feel free to shoot me an email. There's also some information on how to find us at Kulina Health. Um, we have a great team of RDs. If you think you want to work with someone for some of those more specific personalized recommendations that we talked about, um, you can call patient support or hop on the website and we have someone available to match you up with the right RD for you and to verify your insurance benefits. Thank you again. I look forward to your questions. Melissa, thank you so much. That was absolutely terrific. Um, just such such wonderful information that most people don't realize. And a lot of times, you know, someone may be shopping for somebody else. And I always try to emphasize that you have a responsibility if you're doing the shopping and you have a loved one at home who's got a problem or you, we all want to eat healthy. But if you've got someone who's got a heart problem where it's absolutely critical that you're eating healthy, you take on the responsibility of preparing healthy food for that person. I think one of the things that when I first came to this country, I'm, I'm from South Africa, uh, and I landed up looking at apartments and I, I, I noticed how small the kitchens are for a lot of people, really tiny. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is people don't spend a lot of time in the kitchen. So one of the things I just wanted to throw out right off the bat is what about ordering food in? And it's, it's, it's such a risky situation because it's normally you know, fast foods and a lot of times with trans fats. When people say to you, uh, what's the best way for me to order in? Do what, what do you actually say to them? Of course you want healthy foods, but you don't know what's being put in the foods. So what do you recommend for people? And then I've got a lot of questions for you. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. And I think especially here in the city, um, takeout is such a big part of our culture, right? I, and I usually say like, listen, there's a reason I pay the rent I do. I'm going to utilize all of the restaurants that are around me. I want to wow. experience all of that. Um, and so uh, what I'll often talk about is, first of all, I'll ask how frequently a person is utilizing takeout, right? Because if it's only once a week, again, we're thinking about that 80-20. If it's only once a week, okay, enjoy. And then make sure that when you are preparing your meals at home, you're preparing something in line with a heart healthy pattern and you're gonna save your 10 to 20% for when you go out. If it's someone that is utilizing takeout very frequently, then I will talk through um, how we can kind of game the menus and what types of restaurants we can look for to try to keep it as heart healthy as possible. But it is true that there's typically gonna be more added fat, more sodium, if we're eating a lot of takeout. So it is good to be comfortable preparing your meals. Thank you very much. Uh, you gave your information at, at the end of your talk and if anybody still needs it, please be in touch with us and Anya can give it the information. Melissa's available, she's part of a team. I, I think you may even go shopping with somebody if that's what they, they wanna do with one of their consultations. I mean, it'd be a one, wonderful way to really uh, put your hands onto what they need. Uh, I've got a question from Diana. What about plant-based sausages, um, such as field roast? Yeah, that's a really also, good question. What, what about chicken sausage, also from Diana, if you could take mm -hmm. those two? <clears throat> yeah. So this is going to be a, a label reading and nutrition facts panel question again, it's partly. Um, I'm going to be honest, I don't, I haven't looked at the ingredients on the field roast sausage recently. I'd probably pull them up. Um, but on the whole, what it touches on is when we talk about plant-based eating for heart health, what do we think of these meat replacement products, right? Are impossible, burgers are beyond burgers. There are a lot of products on the market because a lot of people are going plant-based for a variety of reasons. And to me, those meat replacements are not the ideal iteration of a plant-based diet if we're thinking about heart health. Uh, because typically what is happening in a lot of these products is in order to create the correct mouthfeel, the texture, the flavor, you're ending up with a lot of added sodium. You're also often ending up with a lot of added coconut fat. And I think that this is probably gonna touch on other questions that come up, um, but the jury is still out on coconut because it's a saturated fat. And while there is, people are starting to advocate for it as acting differently in our body and there's starting to be some research, I don't feel like I have enough evidence to start recommending that people uh, with elevated lipids or at risk for heart disease utilize those products frequently. So like the Impossible Burgers, Beyond Burgers, probably the Field Roast, I have to check it, uh, would fall into more of a sometimes category for me. And then the same with the chicken sausage. You know, the more ingredients you have, 
the more you are kind of running the chance of having preservatives or other stuff mixed into there, that is not as ideal for you. Um, but if something's relatively low in sodium and doesn't have like a laundry list of ingredients, that seems fine sometimes. Okay, great. Uh, from Jess Tal, I remember commercials in the 90s that proclaimed pork as the other white meat. Are there cuts of pork that are lean? I think you mentioned that in your talk, pork tenderloin. Uh, anything else to say about that? Yeah, I remember those commercials too. Um, <clears throat> That was a good media blitz. Um, so I, yes, pork tenderloin is the leanest one. And you can also kind of trim a center cut pork chop. This is a place where I'll, I'll again, always zoom out to the big picture pattern. And it's that we see best results when meats, and I will include pork in that, are used more sparingly. And this is a good example of why we can get led astray if we drill down only to individual nutrients. Because what we're seeing more and more is it's probably not just the fat content. We're seeing that there are, are other components in meat that are possibly getting, you know, broken down by the bacteria in our gut. We just talked about it at one of Dr. Goodman's conferences, right? And then releasing some other compounds into our blood that are affecting our heart health. So pork still more sparingly, leanest cut tenderloin. Okay. Also from Jess, any cookbooks that you can recommend for people on how to cook healthy dishes on a realistic budget. Uh, you did a great job once at one of the lectures, actually showing people how they can cook healthy. Maybe we should. Maybe what we should do is uh, uh, recommend that you come up with a little cookbook for our patients. I don't know what you have in your center or if you've done that already. I would love that. I love food. Um, we could do a demo one day, maybe, Doctor. Yeah. So, <laughs> so cookbooks for a budget not the budget piece nothing in particular is coming to mind um there are some books that i'll recommend sometimes say for example someone's trying to increase um their use of plant-based meals and they really love cooking they're really into it um mark bitman who was writing for the new york times and has a lot of cookbooks he kind of went on his own health journey and created this own sort of flexitarian type plan for himself that he called VB6, Vegan Before Six. And he's got a book about it and he's got a cookbook. Um, and there's also um, uh, Tracy, DJ Blattner's book. She's the RD that came up with the flexitarian plan and she's got a cookbook as well that's got some good stuff in there. There's also lots of recipes for the DASH diet online on the NAH website. And there's lots of recipes on the American Heart Association website that are great. Okay, good. Uh, I've got a question from Sona Kumar, um, and, and this is really a good question because I get asked this all the time as well. And he said, regarding some dairy products, milk, yogurt, cheese, I saw some info that processing these products into low fat can make them more harmful than to eat full fat versions. And fat can help digestion as well. Would appreciate the comment. And it really what we, we're talking about, are you better off having something like a skim milk or having a small amount of whole milk where it's not as processed? And uh, I, I think it's a good question and I'll leave it to you to give the first answer and then I'll weigh in. Okay. It is a good question. And you know, what's interesting is even among my profession, I was just having a little debate about this with another RD at Kulina. Um, this is a tough one because I, I don't feel strongly about it being about the processing, but maybe that's information that's coming to light. But what's interesting to me is that when you look at the guidelines coming out of Europe, um, they're actually more favorable towards dairy and they're more favorable towards dairy fat. Um, portion is going to be important there. Um, but there, are, I think there are some questions being raised about whether it all has to be low fat skin products or whether we can liberalize a little bit there as part of the overall healthy pattern, right? I think that's what's most important. Um, but then I think about something like the DASH plan, right? The dietary approaches to stop hypertension, where we have so many trials and then so much follow-up um, uh, kind of observational study. This is a plan that is really leans into low fat dairy, like three servings of it a day. And people do great. Uh, it lowers blood pressure, it prevents diabetes. Um, so I feel like I have evidence on both sides right now, but the evidence favoring the full fat dairy is more nascent, if that makes sense. No, I think, think, excellent, I think it's an excellent answer. And I think we really don't know for sure. But one thing is, I think, clear. You can have the whole, whole milk or and not feel like you're doing something terrible. You keep it down to a minimum. And it's really about the fat. 
So if if you have a small amount of fat that that uh, is in the whole milk, and so you're avoiding a lot of processing. I mean, I once heard, and I did read this, so that's why I'm prepared to say this, that, you know, if you take a complete fat-free milk, um, it actually, by the time they finish processing it, it actually is a blue color. Uh, and they've got to get rid of a blue color. No one wants to see that in your milk. So they put something else in there that's processed. So I think we it, the, the jury's not out, but I think it's an excellent question. And um, I think that you can compromise, I think, a little bit instead of having completely zero fat in the milk, 2% or reduced fat is probably a good compromise and a way to go. Barbara asked a question. I know the answer, and you're going to give it to, and then we're going to move on. Do we think that a Mediterranean diet is better than a typical U.S. diet? And I think we've got a big yes there in capitals. I think, uh, do you want to just comment on that, how really the data, the, in, the, in, the information and the data and the research is all showing how healthy the Mediterranean diet is? Yeah, compared to the standard. Yeah, exactly. compared to the standard US American diet. diet. But there is like kind of our, our healthy U.S. style diet, if you look at the dietary guidelines, so you don't have to like go out and buy tabbouleh. It's just about the ratios of everything. Yeah, I think she said the typical U.S. diet, which I yeah. think the typical U.S. diet is not a healthy diet, and that's why we've got so much obesity and heart disease. Um, let's, Anya, can you just put up some of the questions? And let's see, I think we've got uh, only a few minutes so maybe short answers, and we'll try to get through them. Avoiding I'm so bad at that. Okay. <laughs> you, I know. You're gonna, you're gonna do it. Avoiding saturated okay. dairy fats in packaged goods results in coconut oil and palm oil substitutes. Are they any healthier? No. <laughs> They're not any healthier. I agree with you. We don't uh, think so yet. <laughs> next slide. Yeah. I need prepared meals because I don't like to cook. What are my best options? I think we've reviewed that and. Uh, we're going to move on. But that's obviously a very important question and hoping you got a lot of answers from Melissa's talk. Next slide. Seeking suggestions for feeding someone with an ailing heart who has had a gastric bypass and only eats very small amounts of food. Same foods, just smaller portions. And keep in mind kind of the balance so that probably you want to be eating your protein first so that you don't lose muscle. Okay, excellent. Next one. Where can you buy fresh fruits and vegetables on a budget? So this, just to wrap up what we already touched on, right? Buying seasonally helps. Remember, you can use the freezer aisle as well. Um, and remember, there are some ways to use canned items if you can be a smart shopper. And I think sometimes the farmer's markets, you can get some really good deals and fresh, um, healthy food that yeah. are at very reasonable prices. Yeah, and they're everywhere. If you go to grownyc.com, they'll tell you where your local farmer's market is. What What was that? I believe it's grownyc.com. If you're yeah. in the boroughs, it'll tell you your nearest. Grownyc.com. Next one. Why are drugs offered first to patients instead of this approach to heart disease? Okay, it looks like I planted that. Melissa, maybe you can give a plug to our <laughs> prevention center. Maybe take that and then I'll end off. This is my response to that. If you look at the guidelines from the major medical associations, actually they all say lifestyle modification first. And they say to do it at the thresholds of blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar, before we're to the point where it's recommending medication. And it always says medication plus lifestyle. So it is in the guidelines and your doctor should be giving you that option. And an RD can help because it's hard for the doctor to talk about it all in one session. So I actually agree with that. And I think everybody knows that one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about our lecture series and our prevention center is every single patient, no matter what they see us for, we're talking about how to have a healthy lifestyle. And nutrition is right up there at the top. That's why we have you on so many times. And when we had the pleasure of having you in our department, uh, we, we always talk to patients about nutrition, about exercise and flexibility about sleep and about stress management, because those are the important risk factors for cardiovascular disease and many, many, and many other chronic conditions. So even if you are given drugs, which obviously many times you are, we always talk about these other healthy lifestyle habits that are just as important. And in fact, hopefully you can avoid drugs because of that. And hopefully you can get some of the drugs reduced and maybe off your drugs if you maintain these healthy habits. And this prevention series that I'm doing is always in line with these healthy risk factors, these healthy habits 
that I'm trying to educate people so that they're more likely to take them on board and avoid medications and procedures. So Melissa, as usual, outstanding. Thank you so much. Um, it's really wonderful to have you on. We look forward to having you again and thank you very much for your time. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Once again, here's the website, hearthealthnyulangone.org is a website that you can get to and find us. And if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with Anya. Let me just end off with a shout out to Anya Coates, who does a fantastic job working with me and helping me make this series so successful. We look forward to seeing you again uh, in, at our next, next lecture, uh, which is in November, and I gave you the dates. Thank you very much.